Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Tom Zook's U.S. Civil War Diary, 1863, Part 4. February 23, 1863. Our force having been augmented the night before by four companies of cavalry. Here we also found that the Reb force consisted of 200 cavalry and two or three pieces of artillery. Now he's down on the Mississippi River near Vicksburg, Mississippi. After we got across the stream, we followed on at double quick most of the time, but did not come up to the cavalry until nearly dark when we found that they had abandoned the chase, having met the Rebs and cornered them two or three times, and at one time got possession of some of their artillery, but the Sesesh made a dash and retook it all again. The result of today's work is two or three taken, prisoners on our side, and one killed, while the rebel loss is eight or ten prisoners, and about the same number killed. The general blames the whole thing upon the failure of the battery to come up. For if they had come up in time, we could have captured the whole reb force. But we had good quarters tonight, and plenty of chickens, eggs, hogs, etc. to eat, as we always quarter on some large plantation upon these kind of trips and are allowed to take anything that we can make use of. February 24th, 1863. Today we return to the boats on nearly, nearly the same route that we went over yesterday, with the exception of some slight variations, which were made to gain some better wads that did not lessen the distance, by the way. It took the whole day to make the return march, but we took it very gradually and rested a good deal by the way. February 25th. This morning we steamed down the river in direction of camp, and I do believe the boys are almost as happy in anticipation of getting back to camp as they would be if they were going home. The run has been pretty steady today, only a few short stops for the purpose of putting forage on the boat. February 26th. Today the weather has been very rough, and consequently the running a little unsafe. Sometimes the boat was blown so much to one side that one would think they were surely going to capsize, but we always managed to make sure before anything serious happened. We arrived at camp about 3 o'clock p.m. and were speedily disembarked in the mud and rain, and joyously received by the boys who remained behind. February 27th. This morning it came off clear again, and the boys have taken advantage of the sunshine to wash and dry their clothes. Aside from this, there has been nothing done in camp of consequence. February 28th. Today, as yesterday, has been passed without anything happening of interest, with the exception that the boys are still trying to get themselves in some kind of decent cleanliness. Today, I received a letter from Father and accompanying it from Otho Cannibal. March 1st. Today is a beautiful sunny day, and we have all taken our tents down to sun them and the ground they cover. I wrote to Anna today, and a troublesome time I had of it too, for the boys were constantly worrying me and teasing me, so that I could scarcely keep my thoughts collected. Nothing strange in camp life has taken place. March 2nd. Today got a squad of men together and gave our company parade ground a going over, trying if possible to make it so that it would be decent in rainy weather. The lieutenant, Williams, tells me that he has good reason to think that our our brig brigade, Burbridge, will soon be moved north, and I hope it may prove true. March 3rd. This morning we are on, bo on board the boat Duke of Argyle for the purpose of running down to the canal to dig and wield dirt. After getting to the section assigned to our regiment, we found it pretty well thrown out, and so pitched in and, and worked where they will until 4 p.m. Notwithstanding, the Rebs sent an occasional shell over our heads. We then returned to camp on foot by, by way of the levee and the camp of the lower part of our company, and to one not accustomed to such sights, it must appear tremendous, for from the head of the can canal up to our camp three miles, the ground back of the levee is just white with tents, almost as far as the eye can reach. This is not at all for this same camp continues three miles above us. General Grant, in company with General Sherman, passed us on the levee as we were returning this evening. He is not, General Grant is not a remarkable-looking man by any means, of medium height, rather heavy-set, 
and dresses plainly, or as plain as is consistent with his rank and position. March 4th. Today we remained in camp, and those that were able tried to fix up a little about the tents. Now I begin to think if we do not have much wet weather, we can keep our camp in pretty good order as far as the looks are concerned. We can never get the poisonous atmosphere removed, nor the water in a fit condition for drinking and cooking purposes. It is full of that which causes disease, and we can't help it. March 5th. At 9 o'clock today, we went on picket again, and I am not sorry, for if we had not been detailed on this duty, we should have been sent to work on the canal. And I don't fancy that work very much, no, much no how. 6 o'clock p.m. The weather has been fine today, but this evening it threatens rain, and the boys are fixing shelters to turn, to turn the wet if possible. March 6th. Last night we were agreeably disappointed in not getting the expected shower, for about 8 o'clock it cleared off beautifully and remained so until morning. This morning at 9 o'clock we were, re were relieved and returned to camp, after which I took another round at the wash tub. This afternoon it was determined that our camp should have a few alterations made in it. Every man that is able to handle a shovel or a pick was called upon to turn out and help lengthen the ditches and move tents. Benjamin Kennedy of Mess No. 3, Company D, died in one of the regimental hospital tents this forenoon. He was a good boy and made a dutiful soldier, and is much lamented by those with whom he had been associated and acquainted. March 7th. We have been busily engaged straightening up our company parade grounds and removing and changing our tents, but it looks like foolishness, for we expect to be ordered away from here immediately. We are looking for the order every hour. The new levee on the canal has been swept away by the river, and any attempt to go any farther now would be simply fool foolhardiness. Where we will now be taken to I cannot imagine, but it will be up the river for some point. March 8th, Sunday once more. Today we had a sermon from a strange chaplain, and he proved to be a good preacher, and the boys listened to him with marked interest. This evening, Captain Coulter preached to us one of his own kind of sermons. March 9th. On guard today again. I don't know but, but that I make by the operation for the rest of the boys have the streets to straighten up and a good deal of other fatigue duty to perform. March 10th. Last night there was quite a hubbub kicked up by the gunboat running the gauntlet past the Vicksburg batteries. The firing was heavy, heavy for quite a while. The weather is wet and unpleasant. Notwithstanding, the paymaster is on hand and paying off the boys as fast as circumstances will permit. We receive pay up to the 1st of October. March 11th. This morning we are ordered to be ready to go in, in one hour. We drew three days' rations, but are not ordered to cook any ahead. After waiting around all day for the order to come, at length night has come and no order. We will now probably not go until tomorrow sometime. March 12th. This morning we are again ordered to be ready to go in one hour and a half. About nine o'clock the bugle sounded the call for strike tents, and in short order our tents were on the ground and ready packed for being carried on board the boat. About ten o'clock we had everything safe on the, the Marie Denning and immediately pulled out and moved up to some coal barges began taking on coal, which operation kept us until about 3 p.m., when we once more moved, up, moved off up the river. About 6 o'clock, we arrived at Milliken's Bend, and the regiment was disembarked and marched to their intended campground, but the ground was found unfit for the purpose intended, and so the regiment was again put on board the boat to remain until morning, when a better place is to be looked up. March 13th. This morning we are again on a new campground. It is not far away from where we went last night, but the ground is much better. The first things the boys pitched into was the cuckleburrs. Soon they had a nice place cleared for our tents. The next thing was some old buildings that stood near had to come down to furnish lumber for floors. And so by night we had very comfortable places to sleep in. March 14th. This morning the parade ground had to be pitched into and, as, quote, many hands make light work, that, tune was, that too was soon clear of all obstructions. 
Next came the dishing in and about the quarters, which is now in a fair way to be soon done up in fine order. Our parade grounds look all right this evening. This is the best arranged camp that we have ever had. March 15th. Sunday again, but this time it is raining and bad out of doors, and so the ordinary Sunday morning inspection has been omitted, and the boys have kept close to their tents. The weather clearing up a little, the church call was made, and a very interesting sermon preached by our chaplain. March 16th. Today has been so wet and muddy that all kinds of camp duties have been omitted. March 17th. This morning, Company D is off for the picket station, and the boys feel glad that they can get out from the confinement of camp and breathe once more a free atmosphere. The picket station is about a mile and a half from camp, and the country about here must be a fine-looking country in the dry season, but it is now full of water, and all kinds of waterfowl and creatures that live in the water here unite in the midnight chorus. March 18th. A calm and beautiful day. Camp duties unchanged and monotonous. March 19th. Nothing of importance until about 3 in the afternoon. An order came for the inspection of arms, and that immediately. Old Vance had received the order in the morning and stuck it in his pocket for Colonel Brown, who was in command of the regiment, and then forgot it till the time came for the inspection to come off. March 20th. This morning we are ordered to be ready for general inspection by 11 o'clock and the boys have all got their arms rubbed up and are laying around waiting for the general to come around and do his part of the job. About 2 p.m., General Smith made his appearance and in about one hour went through with the inspection. He expressed surprise that our regiment was so thronged in numbers and that something should be done right away to better our condition. March 21st, as there was nothing of importance going on in our regiment today, I obtained a pass of Lieutenant Williams and strolled off down the levee for about a mile and a half to the camp of the 120th 120th OVS to see Cousin Joseph Slagle. I found their camp situated in just about such a looking place as we occupy, but they have not taken the pains to fix, fix up that our boys have. March 22. This morning I am on camp guard again. Just my luck to get on duty on Sunday, and a bad rainy afternoon at that with the prospect of a very wet night. But I did not let my guard duties prevent me from attending preaching. We had an excellent sermon from Chaplain Ketchum. March 23rd. Last night was a very muddy wet night, and this thing of keeping out camp guards in such wet weather I deem an imposition. Today has continued very wet, and the camp is getting very muddy. March 24th. Last night we had one of those terrific storms that appear to prevail here about this time of the year, and this forenoon another that threatened for a while to tear our frail tents from their fastenings. I never witnessed such rainstorms before. March 25th. Today we had a brigade review, and the brigade did not look much larger than our regiment used to at Camp Bates. It was indeed a mournful spectacle to those who had seen the brigade in the times when it was full and in its glory. Some of General Curtis's army landed just above us today, and I learn have since gone into camp there. March 26th. This has been an exceedingly dull day in camp, for we, when not on special duty, have nothing at all to do, and then not, and then not have anything to read or to beguile the weary hours which makes time hang heavily on our hands. March 27th. Today, like yesterday, has been very dull. Nothing of importance has taken place to break the monotonous course of camp life. March 28th. Today has been another quiet, dull day, but notwithstanding, the boys got together and had a lively time at a game of ball for an hour or two. I think he's talking about baseball here. March 29th. This day has come and gone and left no track of remembrance. March 30th, another dull, uninteresting day. There is some commotion on the levee, regiments moving up and down. March 31st, more moving of troops on the levee today. Some regiments have gone about 12 miles into the interior interior back of us to act as a kind of rear guard for the army here. I was detailed on fatigue duty, on fatigue today, and had a hard job helping unload a boat. 
April 1st. Laying around camp as usual, drilling, drilling about enough to keep us from forgetting how the cutters are beginning to charge us enormous prices for everything that they have to sell. Potatoes, five cents a piece. Cheese, 40 cents per pound. Butter, 40 cents. Eggs, 50 cents. Crackers, 30 cents. Boots, $10 to $14 per pair. And everything else in proportion. It appears that every person is bound to fleece the poor soldier if possible. April 2nd. Nothing of importance has occurred today. The weather con still continues very warm, although we have remarkably cool nights considering how warm the days are. April 3rd. On guard today again. We now have a full camp guard, but what it is for I cannot tell, unless it is to keep the boys from becoming too lazy. April 4th. Today is another dull, dreary day. The boys try to find amusement in throwing horseshoes and playing ball. This evening there was an ex extempore prayer meeting in Company E, Captain Coulter's Company Quarters, or rather Parade Ground. The intention is to keep it up as often as convenient. April 5th. Sunday brings again its, brings again its release from camp duties, and it also comes to us now with the regular 11 o'clock preaching and church services that have for the last four months been abandoned. Captain Coulter addressed the members of the 96th this evening and was attentively and gladly listened to. April 8th. Note in margin, the 6th and 7th alike, dry and dull. Nothing in them worthy of a note in a mem memorandum having taken place. One year ago, the most sanguinary battle of the war was fought, the Battle of Shiloh. Tonight, many of the same soldiers that fought upon that bloody battlefield are encamped near us. There has been no kind of demonstration made as yet in our camps in commemoration. The weather still continues very hot and uncomfortable. April 9th. The only thing of interest that has taken place today was old Joe Vance's attempt to drill the regiment on battalion drill. He succeeded as usual, drilled us like fury, but did not learn us anything. Tonight, some of the regiments that were in the Shiloh fight are having a big time celebrating that event. April 10th. T April 10th passed off with nothing of importance occurring to make it worthy of a note in a memorandum. April 11th. Today we have been looking for the paymaster all day, owing to which the usual drill has been dispensed with. Up to four o'clock no paymaster made his appearance. Thereupon old Vance took us out and drilled us for about one hour. So passed the day. April 12th. This day has been more quiet and Sabbath-like than any Sunday we have spent in camp for a long time. Our chaplain has gone home now, so we are deprived of the regular 11 o'clock service. At 3 o'clock, Mr. Scott of Company C delivered a very good sermon, and in the evening we had a prayer meeting in Company E's Company Parade Ground. April 13th has been a rainy, wet day, and we spent most of the time in writing. The paymaster has been expected all day, but did not come. All the brigade has been paid off but the 96th. April 14th. This morning, I and Corporal Franks are detailed to go out with a squad to repair the road between here and Richmond. The regiment also has been ordered to move in the same direction sometime today or tomorrow. About 8 o'clock, the squad started from Burbridge's headquarters, and after leisurely marching along until about 11 o'clock, we came to the place in the road that we were, we were to help to repair, but the work had been nearly completed by a party that had went before. So after working about half an hour, we quit and took up our quarters for the rest of the day and night in some deserted Negroes' quarters that were on a plantation by the roadside. They answered the purpose first rate. The road is extremely muddy between here and camp, the distance about seven and a half miles. There is a portion of Carr's division been camping here, but they have gone on in the direction of Richmond, leaving their tents and camp equipment behind. April 16th. This morning we were up by daybreak, and after breakfasting off the remains of a pig that one of the boys killed last night, we went out to the road to await the coming of the brigade. For we had learned that they were on the road about 8 o'clock. 
The advanced regiment came up, the 83rd OVL, and we followed alongside of them till we were within one mile of Richmond when we stopped at a planter's house by the roadside to rest. The general coming up in the meantime told us that we had better remain there until the regiment came up, so we stayed. About two o'clock, our regiment came along, and after halting for a half hour to rest, once more set out for Richmond, leaving the suburbs of the town about four o'clock where we encamped for the night. There is quite a bay between our camp and the town, and it, is, it has been greatly increased by the breaking of the levee in several places. In fact, the whole country will soon be inundated if the flow is not stopped. Today I ate some ripe strawberries for the first time this year. April 17th. This morning we are up and off by 9 o'clock. The roads are very good for footman, footman for the simple reason that we can follow the levee that has been made by the planters in this vicinity and a protection against the an, annual inundation of the Mississippi. On the east side of the levee, the country is already overflowed, and if the levee should break or be cut in any place along here, it will leave us in a bad situation. About three o'clock, we arrived at Holmes Plantation, where we found the rest of our brigade encamped. So we pitched tents by the side of the levee as the other regiments had done before. We will remain here for some time, perhaps ten days, if nothing turns up sooner to cause a move. April 18th. Today the weather has been fine. Nothing of importance has taken place. We occasionally hear some heavy firing in the direction of Vicksburg, which place, it is said, is only about 10 miles from here across the country. April 19th. This has indeed been like Sabbath, for we are now away from the noise and confusion of the landing of boats and unloading of troops and supplies. Mr. Scott of, Mr. Scott of Company C preached for us in the evening, and Captain Coulter wound up the services by a few appropriate remarks. April 20th. Today is warm and pleasant. The regular drill has been commenced and will probably be kept up now as long as we remain. April 21st. Some heavy firing has been heard in the direction of Vicksburg last night and this morning. The weather was fine up till 2 o'clock when the sky became clouded and soon the pattering of rain on our canvas houses gave us to understand that we might expect an, another ugly night. This is a strange climate indeed. It seems to rain whenever it pleases, quote, and so easy. April 22nd. This has been a very warm day, and the boys are crawling into the shade wherever they can find anything that will afford a shelter. I am beginning to get tired of this place. It is so very lonesome. I want to see the war done up in this section, and then I would like to get where it is not quite so hot as fast as possible. April 23rd. Last night there was some Terribly heavy firing in the direction of Vicksburg. It lasted nearly all night, and this morning was resumed for about half an hour. Nothing of importance has taken place in camp today. April 24th. Nothing of importance has taken place today up till 6 o'clock p.m., when we were ordered to be ready with one day's rations to march in 15 minutes. Accordingly, we soon are ready and off. April 25th. This morning about 1 o'clock we arrived at a plantation known as Smith's Plantation and after stack, stacking arms proceeded to make our beds upon the ground, which by the way proved to be pretty soft, and slept soundly until morning. Upon looking around we discovered that our campground was in an extensive cornfield immediately on the bank of the bayou, upon which we will embark for the Mississippi again. 2 o'clock p.m. We are on the boats creeping through the wood, yes, actually through the woods, for this, for this bayou has only a narrow channel and is only navig navigable for small steamers when the country is overflown from the Mississippi River, and then they can only come up about, about two miles. About three o'clock we attempted to land for the purpose of unloading the troops, but the boat stuck fast in the mud and we could not make the shore. Neither could the boat be got loose. So here night overtakes us, and we are still fast in the mud. April 26th. It was 9 o'clock last night before the boat was got loose from the bank of mud, and then it was deemed too late to attempt to go any further until morning. So the troops remained on the boats till morning. Early this morning we are off for camp. 
a distance of about six miles down the Mississippi levee. We passed on our way through the little town of New Carthage, or rather what remains of it, for it has been almost entirely destroyed by the troops that have from time to time encamped here. Our camp is about four miles below Carthage and is on the plantation of a Louisiana judge. The groves, gardens, pleasure grounds are still to be seen, and thousands of roses and other flowers now surround the tents of the soldiers, but the buildings are in ashes. It is said that the owner set fire to them when New Orleans fell into our hands, so that the Yankees should not enjoy any of the comforts that he had so nicely cultivated and arranged for himself. This has been indeed a beautiful place. Everything that nature and art could furnish to make it beautiful had been brought into requisition, and at this season of the year must have furnished a scene of oriental splendor. What fools, to deprive themselves of, of such homes for the sake of extending the accursed institution. He's talking about slavery, I believe. April 27th. Today they are loading and shipping troops constantly for Grand Gulf, a distance of 16 miles from here by river. It is said that the rebels have appeared there in large force. April 28th. Last night we were ordered to get three days' rations ready in our and in our haversacks so as to be ready to march at any moment. This morning we were ordered to fall in line with 80 pounds of cartridges and be off for the boats immediately. Upon examining our cartridges, we found that they would not fit the guns, so the order was countermanded, and we, with the 60th Indiana, will remain for a few days here to guard the post. All the other divisions that are here are being moved as fast as possible. Troops are constantly arriving and being shipped to scene of action. Up till dark, it is said that 7,500 troops had passed down. April 29th. This morning, camp is quiet. There are still some troops moving down toward the scene of action. Heavy firing is heard from below, which is no doubt the gunboats engaging the batteries at Grand Gulf. No news from below have reached us from below. April 30th. Last night, Companies D and Company I of our regiment was detailed to go up to a plantation about a half mile below Carthage to fix up the buildings on the plantation for hospital purposes. So this morning finds us busily engaged making bun bunks and scrubbing Negro quarters and cleaning up generally. We have a day or two of work ahead. Up till night, our carpenter squad had over 100 bunks done and ready for use. No news from below have reached us that is reliable, but numerous rumors are afloat among the boys. May 1st. This forenoon we run out of nails and other material that was necessary to finish our work, so we stopped and after eating our dinners, proceeded once more to camp, where we arrived about 4 o'clock p.m. One of our transport vessels was sunk at Grand Gulf today by being run into by one of the others. One man was lost and a battery of artillery on the sunken boat. Our forces are still trying to surround the rebel forts, and if possible, capture the whole force. May 2nd. Today, numerous details have been made from our regiment for fatigue duty. There is nothing definite concerning operations at the Gulf. Some heavy firing is occasionally heard from that direction. Three more siege guns arrived today and were sent down. May 3rd. Sunday again, but no rest for the soldier. A heavy detail is made from the regiment, and Lieutenant Goodman is in charge. I am in the squad. We have to pile up a large body of cotton that has been hauled from the interior to keep it from being spoiled by the wet. It will take most of the day to do the work. This evening, about 405 prisoners were sent up to, the, to this point from the Gulf. There was 1,200 more captured. They will come up sometime tonight or tomorrow. The main body of the enemy have succeeded in evacuating, evacuating and are retreating towards Jackson, Mississippi, hotly pursued by our forces. It is also confidently asserted that General Sherman is rapidly advancing from above, from above Vicksburg and may form a junction with McClelland in the rear of that doomed city. May 4th. Today troops have been passing this point almost constantly. Two whole divisions have passed through, among which are many Ohio regiments. I looked among them, but, but could discover no familiar faces. May 5th. 
This morning I am on detail for duty down at the river. After reporting, I found that I would have to work at carpentering on a building that is being put up to shelter commissary stores. Commissary stores. I worked on the commissary building until about 11 o'clock when we were set to work repairing the guards of the steamboat moderator that had been broken a few minutes previous by coming in contact with a coal barge. We got a very good dinner on the boat, eating with the officers, as is always the rule among ship's carpenters. Nothing of importance has been heard from the Army below today. May 6th. This is an extremely pleasant and beautiful morning, and the boys are beginning to like the southern weather very well. We now have plenty to eat, and of that, that is good. Our quartermaster seems to be determined that the 96th shall have all that is going, quote, bully for him. May 7th. Today another squad of prisoners came up from the Gulf and were immediately sent forward to shipment to Camp Chase. Nothing of importance has transpired in camp today. May 8th. It is rumored today that General Osterhands with 1,500 of his men have been prisoners by the Rebs. It is also said that Grant has possession of Jackson, but it is all, a, it is all rumor. May 9th. Large bodies of troops have been passing this point today. They belong to Sherman's Army Corps and come from Milliken's Bend and Young's Point. There must be a tremendous army advancing toward Jackson by this time, and its numbers are constantly being augmented by reinforcements. May 10th, Sunday. Today has been chiefly devoted to letter writing, and Captain Coulter preached to the boys in the grove, but I, but I did but I did not get out to here for the simple reason that I had for the day assumed responsibility of getting dinner. In the evening I go on picket. May 11th. Our picket station I found about a mile and a half from camp. Picketing in this country is pleasant enough if, if it was not so infested by gnats and mosquitoes of the most ravenous kind. Blackberries abound in almost any quantity all around the picket post, and in fact all around the country hereabouts. Return from picket late in the evening. May 12th. Fine sunny morning. Everything seems to rejoice in the beautiful sunlight. Even the birds sing as if they fully appreciated the goodness of the Creator in giving us such blessings. May 13th. Today our pickets were doubled on all the old stations and quite a number of new stations made. The reason it was done was on account of gorillas that are said to be hovering in the vicinity of the camp. News reached us today of General Hooker's advance on Lee's position at Fredericksburg, Virginia, and also of his subsequent retreat across the Rappahannock. This news had a bad effect upon the soldiers. No news of Grant has been received for several days. From appearances now, I think we will be removed from this point soon, but where to, I have no idea. May 14th. Today we received intelligence that Grant was within two miles of Jackson and advancing, meeting with but little or no resistance from the enemy. The probability is that by this time, Jackson is the, in the hands of the Federal force. May 15th. This morning, everybody about camp are expecting to move, but no orders to that effect have been received by the colonel. It is reported and almost universally believed among those who have read all the accounts of the fight that General Hook, Hooker has Richmond, Virginia. It seems to be the opinion that his, Hooker's, strategy has more than matched Lee's generalship. At 5 o'clock p.m., the order, not, the order not having come to move, the usual picket force were detailed and sent out. I am again in charge of a dozen men a half mile from camp and will have to fight like blazes if the Rebs make a dash on us before morning. May 16th. This morning is bright and beautiful, and if it were not for the innumerable quantity of gnats and flies that constantly pester one, it would be a fine place to live. One gunboat and three transports ran the blockade past Vicksburg this morning, and not a, and not a single shot was fired at them. We can't tell what the reason of all this is. May 17th, Sunday. All is quiet about camp today. We had two sermons, one from Sergeant Scott of Company C and one from Captain Coulter. No tidings from Grant have reached us today. May 18th. Today is quiet again about our camp. Occasional firing is heard in the direction of Vicksburg. Our picket has again been reduced 
which undoubtedly means that gorillas are getting scarce in this vicinity. May 19th. Our troops have been fighting at Vicksburg all day long. They have got within sight of the city in the rear and report 9,000 prisoners. The Rebs fight with desperation, but have to submit to superior numbers. It is supposed that tomorrow will end the job. May 20th. Everything in the direction of Vicksburg has been quiet since early this morning. A boat came down in the evening and reported that Grant had the city completely surrounded and held the rebel army in the city completely at his mercy. They claimed that the whole of the rebel force must fall into our hands tomorrow or the next day. One prisoner has taken back, was, was taken back of our camp today by the scouts from the 60th Indiana. He had deserted from the Sesesh and swam the river last night. He is intelligent, but a rabid Sesesh. May 21st. This morning I took a small squad of men and went outside of camp a couple of miles and spent an hour or two gathering blackberries. I never saw the berries so thick nor of such fine quality. The bushes looked black with them. Six more prisoners were sent into camp today. They crossed over from Vicksburg in a boat and were trying to make their escape westward. The siege of Vicksburg is being vigorously prosecuted and now bids fair to be successful before many days transpire. The rebel prisoners seem dispirited and demoralized. They have no hope for the city and confess that it must fall before our vastly superior force. Any amount of rumors are a floating camp, but as usual with camp rumors, but little confidence can be put in any of them. May 22nd. No news of importance has reached us from above today as there is but little boat running down the river, for the last 24 hours. At 5 o'clock p.m. I go on picket and will not be back to camp until tomorrow evening. May 23rd, back in camp again. No news of importance from Vicksburg today, although our mortar boats have been busy shelling all day. Some say that the Rebs are completely hemmed in and cannot do anything, but it must eventually yield. May 24th, Sunday again. Captain Coulter preached for us today, and while he was preaching, a boat run up to the landing and brought us the order to be ready to move by tomorrow morning to join our brigade at Vicksburg. So everything is now hurry and get ready. About 5 o'clock p.m. we were hustled out into lines of battle at the sounds of the long cool, but after standing in line and no secesh coming to pay us their compliments, we were ordered to stack arms and retire to our quarters. But in no case to take Take off our accoutrements, so the night will have to be passed with them on. Heavy shelling in the direction of Vicksburg has, Vicksburg has been going on all day. May 25th. The alarm last night was occasioned by a party of guerrillas making their appearance at our outpost picket station, and it was thought they were coming in sufficient force to give us a pretty fight, but as yet they have not made their appearance, and I doubt now if they will come at all. The boat that was to take us to Vicksburg this morning has not yet made their appearance, and there is no telling now when it will come. The heavy shelling that has been kept up at Vicksburg so incessantly for the last three days and nights ceased entirely this evening. What it means we are all exceedingly anxious to know. Some change has taken place, certainly. May 26th. The firing at Vicksburg was resumed again this morning. It does not appear to be so heavy as heretofore. Yet it has been continued at intervals throughout the whole of the day. It is now 11 days since they commenced fighting up there, and I would be exceedingly gratified if it were the last. For, oh, there must be a terrible amount of suffering occasioned by so much firing. My prayer is that God in His mercy will soon give us the victory and do away with the necessity of such fearful horrors as always attend a heavy battle. May 27th. The heaviest firing that we have heard yet was made at Vicksburg this forenoon. It must have been a gunboat attack on the river batteries of the rebels. We have been looking for a boat to take us away from this camp, but as yet none has come for that purpose. Hundreds of Negroes are arriving at this place almost every day and are taken care of by the officers in charge. Some are enlisted into the service, but as many women and children are among them, It will soon become necessary to send them to a place of greater security. May 28th. 
Today the boat Silver Wave landed at this plantation, and our regiment was ordered to get ready to strike tents and go on board as soon as possible, or rather as soon as the boat could get on a load of cotton. May 29th. Last night about 12 o'clock we got on board the boat and proceeded up the river, but had not run far until a barge that was latched to the side of the boat and laden with cotton burst out at the side, and we had to run up to the bank on the Mississippi side and take the cotton on board the boat. This operation took us until about noon, and then took nearly till night to run to Warrington. Here we landed some few things, wagons, etc., and then run across the river to another landing to discharge the load of cotton. The boys of the 96 will have to unload the cotton before we get back to Warrington again. May 30th. Last night we succeeded in getting our boats unloaded and then went to bed. Early this morning we run back to Warrington, and after unloading our camp equipage, we formed on the bank and stacked arms preparatory to drawing two days' rations and getting our dinners before starting for the brigade. While laying here, I run up to the place where the Rebs had the famous Warrington Battery. This work was not very large, but pretty strong and contained eight guns, but the gunboats knocked it into, quote, pie. To be continued. Comments. First comment is from John S. Ray. My father. ZFM 13 was most interesting. Really conveys a feeling of actually being with the author in the Vicksburg area of Mississippi. His seeing General Ulysses S. Grant and General Sherman in the Levee area lend a lot of feature appeal. His observations about the wildlife, bugs, and blackberries add a very nice touch. The feeling of actually being in a war and very close to the actual fighting gives excitement to the account. The importance of matters spiritual is very clear in view of the repeated references to sermons, preaching, and Sundays. All in all, an excellent ZFMC. John S. Ray, Cleveland, Ohio. The next comment is from Bob and Cheryl Myers. Thank you for the Zook family memories and especially the Civil War diaries. Bob and Cheryl Myers, Sandusky, Ohio. The next comment is from Sammy Kiru in Kenya, Africa. Quote, Thank you very much for the wonderful Zook family memories collections. I don't know where to start nor where to end. I was very much moved by these articles. My parents were very much happy too about the ZFMC articles for they were challenged so much and they have promised to start theirs also for preservation so that the next generation could be in position of knowing how their family members came to be. And this they will be able... And by this, they will be able to learn their own history as you do. That's from Sammy Kiru, Camp Capchino, Kenya, East Africa. The next comment is from Al Alice Garcia Ni Ray. Quote, I read ZFMC Selection 13 with great admiration to your great-great-grandfather Zook. Despite very difficult situations around him, he didn't fail to see the beauty of God's creation, the beautiful sunlight, the chirping, and the singing of the birds and the blackberries. Like your grandma Gertrude, he had a strong faith in God's divine mercy. He was such a war hero. Alice G. Garcia, Ni Ray, Quezon City, Philippines. And finally, a comment from Mark Ray, my brother, quote, I've really enjoyed the ZFM cert. CFMC 13 makes you feel close to someone whose life touched ours. So that concludes our uh, this segment of Tom Zook's uh, Civil War Diary. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck to you in your efforts if if this uh, interests you in in uh, finding and preserving old letters and family old old letters and diaries and interviewing elderly family members while they're still alive and perhaps publishing or making your own family history YouTube videos. So thanks again for watching. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.